All right. Welcome, everyone. Let's get started. Today, we'll talk about 3D printing for consumer products. So, a uh, couple housekeeping things. Uh, if you have questions, I have my colleagues standing by, ready to answer them. In the Q&A panel below, uh, you should be able to enter your questions, and we'll answer them along the way, and I'll address any questions that come up uh, at the end that we haven't answered. Um, and the best view is if your Zoom webinars has that ability to do this side-by-side -side mode because from time to time I'll show pretty awesome parts and you might want to see them uh, as well as the slides. So with that, let's get started. So today we'll talk about 3D printing for consumer products, um, talk a little bit about why 3D printing is relevant uh, in general. Um, so then some of the specific challenges our customers are seeing in the consumer products industry, and then we'll talk about uh, how 3D printing, both in terms of carbon, uh, composite fiber printing, uh, as well as um, metal 3D printing. Uh, we'll look at case studies and examples of why it's a big win. So uh, a little, for context, a little background on the company we're founded in 2015. Uh, we're in our third year of shipping product, and the company was founded around the idea of making 3D printing, in particular metal 3D printing, available for both engineers and uh, engineers, developers in the early stage of the product development uh, process, but also for mass production, for actual production of uh, metal parts that go into products. Uh, and so it's those two things, the early stage of the product life cycle, but also the mass production stage, uh, as well as the, uh, well, uh, the aftermarket, customization, replacement parts, that kind of thing. So really it's, it's uh, metal 3D printing for the entire life cycle, product development, mass production, and uh, the aftermarket. The, we have four product families, or really four platforms, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about each one of them. There's the composite uh, carbon fiber printing, with a fiber product, so that gives you the ability to print continuous fiber reinforced parts, and we'll, we'll take a look at some of them and how impossible they are to break um, with industrial grade tape, continuous fiber uh, tape. Um, we'll talk about the metal 3D printing for uh, in the office, so this, that's the studio system, office friendly, so you, you literally see the system uh, behind me. We're printing. Uh, and sintering right in our offices. And then the binder jetting uh, with a shop system or the production system, depending on kind of the scale you're looking for to do batch or mass production of uh, fully dense metal parts. So we'll talk first about the fiber, then the studio system, and then uh, the binder jetting solutions. So as I mentioned, we're in our third year of shipping product. Uh, this is what our customers look like from space. And uh, here are the some of them, and uh, you'll recognize some of the logos here, and many you won't, and that's kind of the point. Uh, 3D printing is now accessible enough uh, that companies, large and small, in, across a broad range of industries, can afford to bring them in. They're accessible in terms of both costs and um, breadth of applications, uh, simplicity of operation. Uh, so altogether, it's now uh, fully viable metal 3D printing uh, systems uh, for a range of industries and companies. So. Why metal 3D print? I mean, people have been making, producing metal parts uh, since the Iron Age. So what's, what's new? Well, with metal 3D printing, there's a number of key benefits. One is rapid prototyping, the ability to print parts on demand um, when you want to evaluate several design iterations. There's also the ability to do part consolidation. So you might have several parts. In fact, this part that I just held up, this is normally, this is a timing, this happens to be a timing belt pulley uh, in an industrial application, but this was previously uh, several off the shelf components uh, and, and then after the fact, machined, customized and assembled. So instead, uh, one part was designed uh, that replaced multiple parts and that no longer require uh, post-processing or assembly. So. That's a great example of uh, metal 3D printing. You have design freedoms, you have freedom of geometry, and you can create, you can consolidate uh, multiple parts into one. And if you think about consumer products, uh, the more complex the bill of materials is, 
so those parts have to be sourced. Tooling has to be created for some of them. Um, you have to do assembly, you have to do tests. Uh, so the more complex the bill of material, the much more complex the, the whole assembly process and, and ultimately cost and maybe even reliability. So you can eliminate a lot of that by consolidating parts into one. You can do complex geometries. Here's one example. So this is a copper heat exchanger where you have uh, features that are impossible to create using any other technique. Um, so these are two examples of parts that have internal channels, internal conformal, in one case cooling channels, in another case uh, channels for fuel uh, and air mixture to be uh, combined. And so uh, these are impossible to create in other ways. And there's a benefit uh, that you, you therefore can't achieve, can't derive without being able to achieve this geometry. Um, there's design customization. So whether it's, you think about mass produced products, whether it's surgical devices, whether it's, whether it's finger splints uh, that immobilize a finger, you know, if you have a repetitive injury, um, finger splints could be golf clubs. Um, you think about all the variables you may want to adjust uh, and, and, and evaluate. So customizing the design, testing multiple designs, uh, tooling for uh, consumer product, uh, for, so for the production lines, tooling uh, that might be complex to machine, you, you produce too little of it for it to make sense to you know, cast the tooling. And so you wind up often machining uh, and, 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 and doing a lot of uh, kind of post-processing operations. Instead, you can 3D print the final geometry and uh, start producing parts a lot sooner. Um, you can also, with metal 3D printing, do mass production. Uh, and that's a huge benefit. That's a, that's a brand new thing. If you think about the mass production methods uh, today, they've either been around for 100 years or several thousand years, depending on if it's machining or casting uh, or stamping. And with metal 3D printing, you can now avoid both the lead times and effort, non-recurring engineering associated with, with uh, standing up a new manufacturing line. You don't need tooling when you have uh, 3D printing. So mass production of parts, that's a big win. And uh, finally, the digital warehouse. With 3D printing, you can now print just what you need when and where you need it. So there's no, there's no need to rely on a centralized production. Uh, there's no worry about distribution, uh, the logistics supply chain, tariffs. Uh, every time you cross a border, there's tariffs. And you can really, with 3D printing, match the production rates to the demand. You know, if you need to produce 10 a week or 10,000 a week or a million a month, there's probably a metal 3D printing solution for that. So that, that really uh, uh, makes the supply chain a lot more robust, a lot uh, simpler, uh, and reduces the time uh, it takes to produce from the time a part is produced to what's actually uh, at the consumer. And so let's talk now a little bit about what are the challenges we've, we've seen uh, our customers are seeing in the consumer product world. There's kind of three, uh, well, five, uh, five total uh, product challenges. And I'll mention them briefly. By the way, we'll distribute these slides uh, after the fact, so don't, uh, don't worry about uh, remembering or reading every single word. Um, so first is customization. There's often with uh, consumer products in particular a need to cu uh, customize, whether it's early in the design process so that you can evaluate various design uh, variants or to customize parts for local markets. Customization is important. Prototyping, the ability to test, evaluate several different design iterations, that's important. Obviously producing parts at the lowest cost at a certain level of quality, that's key. Um, depending on which materials you're working with, quite often you, want, you, you wind up as, as scrap a lot of material that, um, because if you're machining, you're taking away metal and so uh, depending on how expensive the materials are, uh, you, you might be, there might be a 5, 10, or even 20 to 1 kind of waste to final part weight. And so with 3D printing, you're only printing what you need. The rest is uh, recycled. Um, and the last, the last thing, and this is, a, this is a huge one, is the tooling cost and lead time associated with standing up a new production line. You know, if you think about it, you're going to mass produce something maybe through casting or metal injection molding or stamping, you know, with a progressive die. There is considerable time and cost and engineering effort uh, required to, to, to create that tooling. With 3D printing, you don't need to 
create that tooling. And so you have not only reduced expense and constrict and uh, a shrunk timeline when you can bring the product to market, but you also, you have a lot more flexibility. If the design changes uh, or if you want to make changes, it's uh, straightforward to do that with 3D printing. So the additive manufacturing's, uh, additive manufacturing uh, answer to, to, to all of these is with customization, you don't need uh, tooling. And so you print just what you need. With prototyping, instead of waiting for the machinist to free up or the CNC capacity to free up, um, you, can, you can just 3D print what you need, when you need it. Or let's say, uh, here's, here's some tools. Here's actually another good example. Um, let's say you're, this is a, a bracket for a motorcycle part. So this was printed on the studio system. Uh, normally, this a part like this, not this one, because this one's probably too hard to cast, but you could try to cast it. Um, you'd, you'd wait. You'd wait uh, weeks, months uh, for, the, for the casting foundry to start, start cranking these out. And uh, instead, you can come up with the idea over the weekend, print on, uh, print on Monday, and uh, by the end of the week, you're testing these, the different design variants and seeing how they work. Uh, cost, uh, 3D printing, in particular for mass production, can be quite competitive uh, with, with uh, mass, mass production, with conventional mass production methods. Um, and as I mentioned uh, on the previous slide, there's no need for tooling. So let's say you're making, let's say you're making custom gear shifts for your car or for a thousand other cars, and then you want to finish them in a variety of ways. So these parts, you can now 3D print uh, and finish. And as just as you come up with different design options, I'm holding a few of these up, you get the idea. These are all printed in steel and then they're plated. So this is black nickel. This is uh, obviously gold. So you can do customization uh, and new design variants really without the need for tooling. And that, creates a, a great deal of flexibility. And uh, another note on just to drive home this uh, no tooling and, and uh, production rates thing. When you have low volume production, if you think about it, the first one, five, 10 pieces are much harder to produce than the next 10 or 10,000. Um, that's really true for all mass, uh, mass production methods. First few parts is when you figure out the process, you develop the fixturing, the tooling, and this makes the low volume parts a lot more expensive. Um, and so need, having a solution where you can easily, relatively effortlessly print uh, low volumes is just as important in, in some ways as it is to be able to finally mass produce the parts once you zero in on a design. And so here's an example, uh, you know, with a 16 liter shop system, you can pack a whole lot of different parts and they can be different with every print run of what you print. Um, and it's just as easy to print them. So now let's talk a little bit about the examples uh, across all the different consumer product applications. You got golf, in some of the examples I have here, you got, we've seen uh, golf clubs printed, faucets, custom faucets, decorative handles, uh, skateboard trucks, jewelry. Let's see, I think I have, so here's a, here's a bracelet. This one is just, just a little too tight for me to wear in New Jersey. But um, let's see, uh, there's a number of customers already using, uh, using the desktop metal studio system uh, in, in a, a, across a range of uh, consumer industries. Uh, so let's talk, let's talk by product, the product, uh, some of the applications. So with the fiber system, this is a way to print parts that are going to be stronger than steel because they're reinforced with continuous carbon fiber. They're gonna be lighter than aluminum. We'll take a look at some of the data. Um, and you can print them right on your desktop or uh, in this particular case, you can print it right in your car customization uh, shop. So first of all, how does this work? Let's see, do we have, we got a fiber printer in the, in the corner there, so I'm gonna, Rotate that, you see that? Right in the corner is the fiber printer. So this is where we're printing all these awesome fiber parts. So what you can make are strong parts. So with the high density, high quality uh, properties because they're reinforced with continuous uh, fiber composite tape. 
Uh, it's great surface finish. Let's see, I have uh, a couple examples here. I, I wish you could run your finger across this uh, finish. You'll, you'll see that it's crazy smooth. Um, on a profilometer, when I threw this on, I think this was uh, just a couple micron surface roughness. So it's really pretty amazing finish. Um, and you can do this with, you can print on the fiber system with advanced composite materials. So you can use peak pack for high temperature, uh, high strength applications. And the whole thing starts at uh, three or $5,000 a year. The anatomy of these parts. So this is the beauty with that printer. It's just uh, here. The beauty with that printer, that printer right there, is there's two print heads. One is a uh, familiar extrusion-based uh, kind of printer with a uh, uh, filament. Uh, and really, this is used to enclose the part and provide the detail that can't be achieved with a continuous tape. So for example, if you look at parts like this, the outside of it is uh, an extrusion-based printer, just like you might, you might have with uh, just a nylon printer. But inside, inside is uh, where a lot of the magic happens. Uh, this is reinforced with tape. So imagine tape, same tape that's uh, making aerospace, uh, aerospace parts, uh, uh, airplane fuselages and other components, but cut into, into a relatively narrow tape, three millimeters wide, and then you can place it where you want. And really, you, you, and you, can, you can decide where it goes in the orientation based on what parts, how it depends on how the part will be loaded. Um, let's see, so here's a fin. Here's a rocket fin or a surfboard fin. Um, this part this part's, uh, is not giving because, because it's reinforced with the tape. And so you can decide, depending on the load, how to orient the tape. Um, and so you wind up with this carbon reinforced tape. You got parts that are, and we'll look at the material properties, that are stronger than steel, but lighter than aluminum. Uh, in, in, in a sense, so the anatomy of a part is the outside shell you print in this, um, in a, a variety of uh, uh, polymers, peak, PEC, PA6, nylon, um, and then it's reinforced with either chopped fiber, and that chopped fiber um, can be throughout this, uh, this shell, and then inside, selectively, you can decide where do you, uh, do you put the tape down for, for maximum reinforcement. And you can make uh, essentially the whole part out of tape, uh, but you really do want that shell so that it's, uh, so that the outside is uh, nice and smooth and you don't expose the carbon fibers uh, to the outside world. So uh, what, what uh, the resulting parts have uh, multi, you can, you can make structures that are multi-directional um, AFP tape layers. Uh, AFP automatic fiber placement. So micro AFP is uh, because this tape is, uh, is three millimeters wide. Uh, let's take a look at the material properties and then see a whole bunch of examples. So first, let's look at strength. So here's strength. We have, remember there's the shell part, so that's the FFF uh, fused filament. Um, you have the chopped fiber filament, so that's the shell material. I mean, you can make the whole part out of that if you don't want to use tape. And you have the properties in this uh, in this column for the tape. So for example, you see the, the chopped fiber filament has 60 or 110, depending on which one you to, uh, which material you choose, uh, megapascals. But then when you get to the continuous fiber tape, so for example, carbon fiber um, in peak or, or PEC, you have 2,400 uh, megapascals. The comparison is for steel, it's uh, almost four times uh, four times lower strength. So it's just absolutely remarkable. I mean, this is why uh, continuous carbon fiber is, uh, is, is used because it is so such a strong, uh, a strong material. And then as far as density, so it translates to how light the parts are, um, you see the, the material, if there's no tape, it's uh, just about a little over one gram per cubic centimeter uh, with, if, uh, with the reinforcement you're more in the one and a half grams, but still relative to aluminum, aluminum is 2.7. So this is maybe 60% uh, as light as aluminum. And of course steel is, uh, it's, it's more like 
more like four or five times uh, lighter than uh, steel. So this is a, a, just a dramatic benefit you get from, from these parts. So let's look at a bunch of the applications. Here you see a few of them. This is a brake duct uh, that's in the upper right, upper left uh, corner. So this is a brake duct for, for a racing car. Uh, and I'll show a few of the parts, but let's actually take a look at them. So first, a motor housing. So this is a BattleBot motor housing. Um, here's the actual part. Uh, it heats up, um, it, so it's a custom housing made for a motor, and so this was designed in the context of the motor that has to fit in here. Uh, what's needed from this part is to withstand uh, a lot of the forces, uh, including saws, axes, flamethrowers that the robot sees in competition, um, as well as the well temperature that the motor uh, motorizes. So you can't just print this in nylon. So by printing this with um, with peak with uh, carbon fiber reinforced, you can print this pretty quickly um, and wind up with a very light part, as opposed to if you wind up machining something, let's say out of aluminum. Um, and this part winds up being uh, sixty, seventy dollars. Uh, you can make all sorts of custom brackets. I'm going to show a couple of these. Um, let's see, there, there's one for a, for a wheelchair, and I'll show in a second. But you see, uh, just as you invariably, for a lot of consumer projects, a lot of custom projects, you have custom brackets. And so now you can uh, pretty easily design it, print it, and uh, have it within, uh, within hours. Uh, here's an, a great example from uh, a, an all-terrain wheelchair. It's an all-terrain, uh, kind of a racing wheelchair, and so because it goes through mud so that the user doesn't have to, uh, well, uh, touch the wheels that are, that are in mud, uh, this was, um, the, the traditional wheelchair design was modified to have uh, levers, custom lever, and uh, there's a connector. And this is the connector. Uh, so there's a lot of forces involved. This needs to be light, and so now, you can, uh, you know, weight reduction is critical because the whole thing obviously is user powered. Normally this was machined out of aluminum requiring, uh, you know, considerable lead time for the little shop. Um, and there are high stresses involved. So you can't just print it in, uh, in uh, basic plastic. And so with, by printing it with uh, PA6 and fiberglass, why fiberglass tape instead of continuous carbon fiber? Uh, it's lower cost and uh, works quite well, it's still quite strong. And so, you get the benefit of uh, the fiberglass tape uh, all in a uh, PA6 shell. So here's a part uh, in a few hours and $12 later, you have a great custom uh, connector. Here's a curling whip design. Uh, so this is an, an adaptation of curling for athletes for the Paralympic Games. This is a custom assembly that goes on the end of a stick to push the curling stone. And the shape and weight of it is, is uh, Pretty critical and so plastic alone if you just print this in plastic uh, the part uh, invariably breaks and so this was instead printed with a uh, reinforced uh, reinforced fiberglass in this case with uh, PA6 again so again uh, about 11 12 dollars later and a few hours later you have this custom design and one of the big wins is the ability to a customize it for the for the particular for the individual and the way they they hold um, and orient the curling whip, uh, as well as uh, to, to evaluate several design variants. Uh, so normally you might need to wait a couple of weeks for it to get machined out of aluminum. Now you can come up with several designs, print them in parallel, and evaluate them uh, uh, same day. Another great example is uh, UHF radio housing. So this is a housing for a, um, that, that's gonna be used uh, in a cube satellite. So actually being launched into space. Uh, this is a pretty small part with a lot of complex features and that makes it really ideal for printing. Uh, because of the extreme temperatures and ESD compliance, because there's electronics uh, inside that'll be affected, um, PA6 wouldn't do. And so PEC was chosen, PEC with uh, uh, carbon fiber. So this is, PEC is important uh, because the temperatures and uh, if you, if you send nylon, like PA6, into space, it outgasses, which is, uh, which is a problem in space. And so, uh, instead, print it with, uh, with PEC and uh, shoot it into space. All right, rocket fin. We, I showed this part a little bit, but uh, so this is an idea 
this is a concept. This is one of several design variants for a custom uh, uh, rocket design. Um, and so the spin, you know, it's 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 key. It's a key component to make it uh, to make the rocket uh, stable during flight. Custom design for each rocket. A lot of parameters to to explore. And the beauty is, for example, in a research or a student setting, you giving people the ability to design to, to sort of link the following disciplines. You got the design process, you got the simulation, and you got prototyping and actual engineering. And so this helps close the loop. Students can design, print, and then evaluate, um, simulate, and then evaluate in, in real life. And so this part printed uh, for uh, just about $20 um, in a couple of hours with, with peak because of the temperatures and uh, carbon fiber, uh, continuous carbon fiber for the strength. Um, another part of a different rocket, uh, tail cones. So this is, this, is, uh, this is one of these tail cones. Here's another. Um, this is the tail cone is added onto the rocket to ensure optimal airflow. Uh, and so with 3D printing, you can remove traditional manufacturing challenges, process constraints, and really design uh, design what the rocket needs without constraining it. Hey, what can I, what can I actually machine? Um, and the volumes here are so small that initially small, uh, that, that doing, you know, mass production processes, uh, really wouldn't work. And so instead of machining a few, you're never going to cast this stuff, but instead of machining, uh, these, you can, you can now 3d print them and peak, especially reinforced with a carbon fiber, uh, winds up giving you the strength and uh, uh, the low mass that uh, that is so key here. All right, so that's carbon fiber, and uh, I've enjoyed um, talking about that. But now let's talk about metal. I mean, we are called desktop metal. So uh, our approach in printing metal is um, we've chosen as a platform, printing systems built around the chemistry and the powder supply chain of metal injection molding. Um, what is MIM? MIM uh, is a well-known, well-understood uh, powder metallurgy process that enables uh, the creation of complex, complex parts and mass production of those parts at low cost using low cost metal powders. And because this is a well-known, well-understood, established process that's uh, around 60 years old, there's great standards um, that have been developed and adopted worldwide. Uh, and this is as a process, metal injection molding, is a process that really supports a broad range of alloys. So this is, you can make steels, copper, titanium, uh, over a hundred different alloys. And so we've chosen this as, um, as the platform so that the systems, the platforms we've developed uh, will we'll be able to print a broad range of materials. So a little bit about how does MIM work and then we'll talk how do our printing systems work? How do we reproduce this? So MIM is kind of a four step process. You start with uh, taking the metal powder uh, and mixing it with a polymer binder into feedstock. And that's really uh, those feedstock, those pellets are then injection molded similar to a plastic injection molding. It's just that, so you're using temperature and pressure to, to melt the plastic, the metal comes along for the ride, and it's injected into, uh, into molds to define the shape. The resulting part is then debound uh, and then sintered. And so that's, that's uh, in, a, in a nutshell, the, the MIM process. Here's how we've built uh, printing systems uh, in, in, in this process. So whereas with MIM, you have this feed, you create the feedstock, you create the shape, there's the debind, there's the center process. We have two families uh, of, of uh, printing systems. One is the bound metal deposition system. So that's the studio system. And that's done by creating feedstock instead of acceptance, uh, instead of forming it into pellets, we form it into rods. By forming it into rods, now this is office safe. Those rods are fed into cartridges cartridges that you see right there, those, that array of uh, cartridges, you just pop them into the printer. So you have different materials, just like you have an inkjet printer. You might put in uh, red, green, blue, or cyan, magenta, yellow, whatever. Um, you, you put in the, the alloy you need, 
Um, and now this is office friendly, this is office safe. And so you print, and then this, this printer using an extrusion, uh, extrusion process, and so it's similar to probably the plastic printers you have, you have near your desk. Uh, the parts, the green parts are then uh, debound, like a, it's like a washing machine, uh, which prepares them for sintering, where, where the final step of uh, evaporating the remaining binder and making the metal particles come together, fuse together through solid state diffusion bonding, take place. Um, and then we have our binder jetting solution, the shop system and the production system. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, those as well. You start with powders, then the shape creation takes place inside the printer. And then there's actually no need for a uh, separate debinder. There's a debind step uh, happening inside the furnace. And so that's kind of the, the two approaches uh, with bond metal deposition and binder jetting that we've, we've taken. And let's talk about the applications and, and uh, benefits of, of each of the two. So first, studio system. Studio system, uh, the one right behind me, for example, is the world's first and only office-friendly metal 3D printing system. It's great, for, it's great for low volume applications. If you need to make a few parts per day, maybe 10, 20, 30 parts per week, um, then Studio System is a great solution. You can make relatively large parts. You can make relatively small parts. So it could be parts like this, or even let's say consumer products. Maybe you want to prototype a uh, lipstick, a lipstick case. And so you see, it's real lipstick. Uh, so you might design this. In fact, you might design a couple different variants uh, and then decide to print them. So Studio System is great for that. Um, it's safe for the office. You're not dealing with the uh, hazardous powders. You're not dealing with lasers. Um, and it creates, uh, it prints separable supports. In other words, you print the part and then it can come off because we print an interface layer. So there's no notion of separating the part from a support like you would with a powder bed fusion or, or a selective laser melting, SLM, DMLS kind of approach. Um, separable supports um, and everything is automated with the uh, software from one you control from one interface all the, the complete system and uh, multiple materials are available and more materials are coming and this is we're in our third year of shipping the studio system uh, and it's shipping in uh, oh, I think it's over 50 countries now what you print with a studio system is uh, near net shaped parts and so for example here's this this part um, this is a relatively large part that normally might be cast. Well, now you can 3D print it. Um, the sweet spot is parts that are the kind of fit in the palm of your hand. Um, so maybe five inch cube kind of parts, although you can print larger. For example, you can even print, this is an engine mount that was printed a little closely in two pieces and then welded along the seam. So you can print relatively large parts. Um, and the way to think about it is it's near net shape parts. You're printing parts with, um, with the resolution, the accuracy, and, and surface finish of a fine casting. And so you might, you might shoot uh, where we're holding ourselves to be better than a percent accuracy um, on uh, linear dimensions. And if you do need to hold extremely tight tolerances on something, as I'm looking around for, for an example, let's say you needed a very tight tolerance on this uh, keyway in this in this gear, this giant gear that's the size of my head. Um, you'd need to machine that. You need to machine that, or whatever post processing, whether it's EDM or grinding. Um, and of course, this is uh, these parts are the alloys you you know. So it's 17.4 pH steel, 316L, uh, 4140 H13 tool steel, and everything you do to metal parts, whether it's whether it's uh, isotropic super finishing uh, from our friends at the REM surface engineering or machining or plating whether it's with gold or other methods or just polishing uh, you can I mean, these alloys uh, it's the familiar alloy so anything you do to metal parts today you can do with these to these parts um, in a variety of materials as I mentioned for different applications um, so there's no powders, no respirators. I mean, this is why it's the only office friendly. Um, there's no dangerous lasers needed. Um, you don't have welded supports. You don't need special facilities or, or a lot of complex venting. Uh, 
So let's take a look at a couple applications. Uh, mentioned skateboard trucks. So normally these are cast. And with uh, 3D printing, you can make parts by removing material. Imagine if you're not constrained by the uh, production methodology of, of, of casting. With casting, you generally want the mass to be all uh, contained and there's no notion of, of uh, like these inner, inner voids. Uh, but if you could remove material wherever you don't have high stresses, uh, the part could actually be not only stronger but lighter. And so with uh, 3D printing, when you're not constrained by casting or other uh, or machining uh, uh, kind of constraints, then uh, you can create the geometries that actually make sense, like as if nature designed these parts. So you can make complex parts. You can uh, you can make custom custom fixtures, uh, jewelry, as I mentioned. I think I was already showing the yeah this guy. Um, there's the you can do of course decorative handles, uh, but not only can you make the parts themselves, or you can prototype the parts themselves. You can also make tooling, fixturing for consumer product manufacturing. And that's, that's the other win. You're probably going to, so let's say this is a, uh, this, here's the part in, in, in question. Um, this fixture needs to hold the phone, holding it during assembly, during rework steps, you're holding a metal part. And uh, if you made this, that fixture out of plastic, it wouldn't withstand the heat. So for, for example, maybe there's soldering going on nearby. And uh, metal against plastic will eventually wear out. Instead, you can make the part, relatively complex part, in uh, and a relatively low volume part. You're not making a thousand of these fixtures. You need a few for the assembly line. So now you can 3D print that metal fixture um, pretty, pretty effortlessly. Uh, more tooling examples. Um, here's an asthma inhaler. This is a mouthpiece for an asthma inhaler. And here you can make a mold, a near net shape mold, made out of a tool steel, which is hard to machine, but you can 3D print it. Um, and you can even add a conformal cooling channel to reduce the cycle time. So you can make more of these per hour, drive down the cost. Um, and the other win, of course, is by 3D printing it to near net shape, you, you are only left with just a couple passes of a CNC mill to get it to be the exact profile you need. So you're not wearing out your tools, your carbide tools or whatever you're using because you're not making 150 passes with a, uh, uh, of, uh, on a tool steel kind of a uh, work piece. You're, you're making just a couple finishing passes. Um, you can also print custom, custom uh, uh, inserts, mold inserts, in this case for uh, zinc, zinc molding of, of uh, custom zippers. And just as the design changes, you can 3D print new inserts and, uh, and start molding. Suddenly, relatively low uh, production runs are viable because you're not spending a lot of time making the tooling. And of course, uh, once you get the near net shape, you can machine, grind, or, or do other post-processing um, for the final, uh, for, the, for the dimensions that need uh, much higher precision than you, can, than you can print. This is an example of uh, EDM. Uh, and then I think I mentioned this briefly, golf clubs, if you think about all the variables on a, on a golf club. Uh, it's the type of club, the, the exact surface area, the grooves, how much weight, what's the weight distribution, what's the angle of, uh, of, of the shaft. So if you think about all those uh, parameters to optimize, there's a couple key wins with uh, 3D printing. For low volume application, there's uh, both prototyping, design evaluation, but also customization. Uh, rapid prototyping can bring the parts to market faster. And then when you're ready to mass produce them. You can use binder jetting, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a, another couple of slides. It's really a viable alternative to casting or machining. Uh, there's no tooling required. You can do mass customization. So this is using 3D printing in the design and low volume customization all the way up to mass customization. Totally possible with metal 3D printing. And here's a couple, couple uh, examples. So imagine your golf club designer, uh, you come up with a bunch of ideas over the weekend, start printing on Monday, by Friday, this is you testing it out. All right, so that's kind of low volume production, low volume printing with the studio system. Now let's talk a little bit about binder jetting. So the challenge that uh, 
that additive manufacturing addresses. The challenge associated with mass production processes that require tooling and on recurring engineering effort um, is it takes, it takes a long time, months and uh, potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to stand up uh, to develop new tooling. So for example, casting is an awesome process that is a few thousand years old used for making complex shape that would otherwise be difficult or not economical to produce via other methods. So the end result of casting is great. The problem, of course, is that it takes a long time. So if you think about all the effort, all the uh, non-recurring effort to uh, produce, to start producing uh, castings, here's an investment casting work, workflow. There's a reason it takes eight, 14 weeks um, and costs so much. And so the end result quite often is there's a lot less des design iteration, a lot uh, less room for optimization. And so, and it can take months routinely to bring up a new production line. So that's the world we're in today. Well, additive manufacturing's answer is mass production via binder jetting. First of all, what is binder jetting? So we had that illustration a few slides back, but the idea is this is an additive manufacturing powder metallurgy process where a liquid binding agent or the binder is selectively deposited. You saw it getting sprayed, and I'm gonna play this video again. It's getting sprayed onto a powder bed to bond the powder particles together and form a solid part, one layer at a time. Think of it as like the temporary glue that's holding your sand castle together, except it's not grains of sand, it's metal powder but just enough to hold it together enough so that when it goes into a furnace and is sintered, that's the shape uh, that, that you wind up with. And so this is really a key, uh, a key technology for mass production. Why is this emerging as the key technology for mass production? Well, it's got high throughput uh, via uh, relative to say laser-based uh, processes. Uh, with with laser-based processes, you need about a million dollars worth of equipment to produce one metric tons of parts per year. That is not a viable approach to mass production. Uh, you can produce parts a hundred times faster with binder jetting, and that's, that's kind of what we're bringing to the market. Um, and also, by using lower cost material inputs for, um, that, that, that leverage all of the, the ecosystem and the multi-billion dollar MIM market, um, there's a, portfolio, a broad portfolio of uh, materials where your base, uh, the, the powders are relatively low, low cost. And so what you wind up with is attractive part costs across a broad range of applications. You have design flexibility, you have great material properties. Uh, the, the parts are essentially isotropic. Isotropic, in other words, the properties in the Z axis versus X versus Y uh, are essentially identical. And so that's a key thing. You don't want, uh, you, you, you don't want the part to be uh, to have different properties depending on the, or the printing orientation. And of course, this is a much more greener process than where the materials are reusable, recyclable versus, um, versus say, casting or, or machining where sometimes you, you actually can't recycle, uh, can't recycle the, the, the metal shavings depending on the material. All right, uh, shop system. So we have the shop system, which is the world's first metal binder jetting solution specifically designed for machine shops. And specifically designed for machine shops means you wheel it through the doors, you put it next to your, uh, your other you know, CNC equipment, um, and the same operators can be trained uh, to produce the kinds of parts you're already making today. And then there's the production system, which is the world's fastest metal 3D printer. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a monster that prints uh, tens of tons of parts per year. So. 20, 30, 50 tons of uh, metric tons of parts can be, uh, so it's like a ton a week you can get. Um, the benefits are, there, there's essentially two key benefits of binder jetting. One, you can reduce costs. You do it through several different ways. You reduce costs by eliminating the tooling, reducing the tool wear, reducing the labor costs, or even the effort it takes to set up jobs. Um, and uh, reducing the number of manufacturing steps by producing parts to near net shape, you can, uh, let's see, I'm gonna show this part. So this is a part printed, binder jetted to near net shape. 
um, and then finishing operations can take place um, if needed. So it's much less steps. Um, you can also increase revenue. You can uh, produce geometries you couldn't produce previously. You can print materials that are very hard to machine. Uh, you can make small jobs much more economical. You can win new business. You can free up existing uh, CNC capacity for new jobs. So you can really save money and make money with, uh, with binder jetting. There's a broad range of parts. I'll uh, show a couple of them here. Um, and you can produce them all, including mass customization, really without tooling. So what you'll see, they're from a, a lot of different applications. They're surgical applications, consumer products, uh, deep inside the, the guts of a machinery. Um, but what they all have in common is they're relatively complex parts that are not trivial to produce with other ways and can't be produced without tooling, uh, except with, uh, with metal 3D printing. So here's some more examples. Um, as I said, uh, here's those custom shift handles. This is just printed and this is uh, gold plated. So here they are. And the whole point is you can 3D print and customize trivially. So these are all three very different designs. So. Um, and here's the shop system, shop system in action. So you see it's uh, printed uh, all sorts of parts. It's, uh, we have started uh, our beta program for this printer. This is a very exciting uh, thing happening, I think both at desktop metal and uh, in the metal 3D printing world with the shop system. You can print small parts too. Here's, a, here's an assembly. In this case, it's a little hinge and you can get a feel for the so it's actually an, an eyeglass hinge. Um, you can see the size relative to a quarter. Um, you can print whole subsystems at once. So inside a consumer power drill, there's actually a, a complex transmission that all uses a, a bunch of custom gears. Those custom gears normally would be metal injection molded and then some with uh, some post-processing. With uh, 3D printing, you can print it directly um, and, uh, and without requiring half a million dollars worth of tooling. So that's, I mean, that's, a, that's the kind of transformational win that you can have with, uh, with binder jetting. Another great example, and we'll, I'll show a couple, uh, couple metrics. So here's a clipper used for cutting hair. Um, and you can produce it on the shop system. In one build, you can produce uh, almost 700 parts. In a week, you can make four or 5,000 of these clipper blades. Um, here's a little sensor housing. You can make a couple hundred. So remember, I mentioned the shop system and the production system. With the shop system, this part, you can make almost, almost 200 per build or about 1,500 a week. They wind up uh, being just about 11, $12. With the production system, you A, can scale almost by a factor of 20, actually more than 20. Um, so you can produce in a week 35,000 of these sensor housing. And the cost drops as well. This is an important thing. The system prints so fast that you amortize uh, its cost uh, actually much faster. And so the parts of the same part uh, is going to be uh, almost 10 times uh, lower cost, or 10, seven, seven or eight times. Six or eight times is, uh, is kind of what we've, what we've seen. And so really it depends on what are the economics. If a part costs you, let's say, $30 to produce via casting or machining today, you can produce it much cheaper on the shop system or even uh, cheaper on the production system. So it's kind of what are the volumes you need, what are the economics dictating. And there's the, tr the traditional trade-off with shop and production between kind of capital expense and the throughput and part cost. Um, another example is bearing housing. Normally you might machine the part, uh, machine this part. It turns out because of the uh, secondary operations, uh, this part is uh, over 150, closer to $200 to, uh, to CNC. Um, and the volumes are such that casting doesn't, doesn't make sense. Uh, well, this part can be, can be 3D printed on the shop system a couple hundred a week with uh, less than $100 a piece, or even you know just a remarkable uh, price break uh, down to you know, almost 85% cheaper or so. 
uh, and producing almost 4,000 of them a week on the shop system. A couple more examples, those uh, gear shift knobs, uh, you can make a couple hundred of these on the shop system or, or about 4,000 a week on the production system. So it depends on the scales that, that you're, uh, you're, you're trying. Uh, then there's the, of course, the shank. This is a consumer product, so maybe hunting is, uh, can, can legally sneak in there. Um, so you can imagine a variety of uh, attachments for hunting applications. Uh, you can vary the geometry. You can make hundreds, almost a thousand a week on the shop system or uh, 20,000 a week on the production system. So now you've seen, I think, every one of our uh, products. You've seen fiber parts and the continuous carbon fiber. Uh, you've seen what you can print on the studio system. And you've seen a whole bunch of uh, shop system parts. Uh, so now you know everything I know about metal 3D printing. So if you want to continue the discussion, and uh, it sounds like any of these systems might be a fit, uh, be glad to book some time with me or one of my colleagues. We can explore your application, see which system might be a fit. And uh, if it makes sense, get, get you a benchmark part with uh, you know, metrics on how many can you produce, how fast, what are the costs, et cetera. So with that, I invite you to check out uh, for more of our webinars, our events page. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. And I'm gonna see if there's any questions left